This form, the second manifestation of the Purusha, is the source and the indestructible seed of multifarious incarnations within the universe. From the particles and portions of this form, different living entities like demigods, men and others are created. So this fairly long purport is describing Karbadakshaya Vishnu, his features and his purpose. And it also describes all those other entities who emanate, the major entities who emanate from him. It doesn't describe all of them because they are unlimited. And for this reason, the living entities should have a great deal of respect and honor this form of vision. Now we can see by the length of his life, it is far beyond our capabilities to understand. We have enough difficulty understanding how someone can get to be a hundred years old. What to speak of his great age want to speak of the long years of those who emanate from him. Of course, not all of them, but many of them have very long lifespans. And their capabilities are also beyond our range to fully understand. We are conditioned souls. We have come here for our rectification because we have committed some sinful activity to the personality of Godhead or to his devotees. And in this place, we're supposed to learn how to correct our behavior. We have very limited senses. We can only see a short distance. We only have so much endurance. And we have actually very little control over the body that we have. Mostly we're under the control of this body. Hmm? Everyone has experienced this. Even someone who is very, very young, someone who is a few days old, he cannot control. Even if you're very old, you still cannot control. You cannot stop the passage of time. 
we have no possibility of being anywhere near the nature of this plenary portion of Lord Vishnu. What to speak of even Lord Brahma, the greatest of the demigods. In a previous Kelpa, living entities that were present in this universe, from amongst them was chosen one individual who was most strictly following all the Vedic principles. And this person in this Kelpa became Lord Brahma. With power of secondary power to create. In other words, the ingredients were all there. He just combined them together in his creation. He didn't originate anything unique. He just used what was already there. And even this is far beyond our comprehension. And so, since it is so far beyond our comprehension, we have to accept what we hear from the Vedic literatures and the advanced Vaishnavas, and in particular, the 12 prominent Mahajans, have to take as fact information that has been given. Now, since we are very much bothered by our minds in this Kali Yuga, it is understood that we really are very, very fallen. And if we are unable to accept what is said in the Vedic literatures and by the previous acharyas, then we are truly lost. Because this is the only way to actually remake any kind of advancement towards the goal of human life. Now this goal is to return to our original transcendental position as eternal servants of Krishna. And if we cannot accept the statements that are coming from the Vedas and the previous Acharyas, then we are definitely of very little faith and we will not make for any advancement at all. Most likely we might even go downward in creation rather than upward into the mode of ignorance. Now we are heavily covered over by passion and ignorance with a tiny smidgen of goodness. And this is our only saving grace. Well, it's not our only saving grace. Our only saving grace is the personality of Godhead. He has not put us in this position he has let us choose what we are going to do. We put ourselves in this position. Hmm? So anyone who doesn't like the kind of body they have and want to get some other kind of body, these are really ignorant people. Huh? And so in the present day, we see so many people like this. They're not satisfied with how they look, you know? So they're going to the gym to build up their physique. They're going to the beauty parlors to improve their appearances. And in the end, they all become old and weak and wrinkled and die away. Huh? What to speak of the people who don't like what sex they are, you know? They chose, according to their desires, they chose what their next body was. 
you know. So we have so many different impressions coming in. And from these impressions, you create different desires. And whichever desires are the most prominent, Krishna arranges that you get a body through his internal potency. He arranges for you to get a body most suitable to fulfill those desires. And he lets you run around and do whatever you like without a whole lot of restrictions. Of course, by your desires, you create particular kinds of karma. And if you don't like your karma, well, that's your fault. You created it. And so Krishna is giving you the opportunity to get out of this material world. Hmm? He's given you free choice to do this, to surrender unto the Vedic literatures of the previous acharyas and to follow their directions with some enthusiasm, with some patience, with some determination. And if you choose not to, well, it's evident you're going to stay around for uh, at least one more birth, if not many more. So if we really want to get out of this material prison house, actually we're in two prison houses. Yeah? One prison house is this material universe. And the second prison we're in is this particular body that we have made up for our, our convenience. So this begins by accepting the authority, whatever the authorities are or whoever they are. Let's say someone causes you some great physical distress or physical or mental distress. There's a common thought that many people believe that you have the right to Break him over the coals for what he's done to you, figuratively speaking. But actually, you don't. You don't have that right. Hmm? There's always someone superior to you who has that right. And ultimately, Krishna has the ultimate right. Perhaps that person that you feel has offended you It's just acting according to your and his karma. So maybe in some previous life you caused all kinds of distress and harm to him and now it's his turn to cause it to you. And Krishna arranges these things by his various different potencies. Hmm? To teach you how to become somewhat humble. So if you're having some argument with someone Maybe it's someone who is superior to you, because in every relationship, there is someone, if there, if there are two parties, one is superior and the other is inferior. There's no way around it. That's how it is. And if you think you're the superior person, you're probably not. Hmm? Probably the other person is a superior person in the relationship. Hmm? So by following all these directions given, just like in, uh, what was it? In the third canto, I think it's the 23rd chapter. Anyway, the title of the chapter is Lamentations of Devahuti. There is described how an inferior person is to relate to a superior person. It's described there. And if you don't follow this, what usually happens is that you meet a similar circumstance in another life until you've learned your lesson. Huh? So if you follow these paths chalked out, 
in the Vedic literatures. And there's so many examples given, just like one of them is the relationship between Kardama Muni and Devahuti. Everyone comes with some added baggage from previous lifetimes, or perhaps from earlier in this lifetime, some particular conditioning. By following directions in the Shastra or by the Acharya, one becomes freed from the entanglement of karma. In a sense, he becomes transcendental to this karmic activity. You still may have some slight fallout, but it's not as heavy if you choose the right path. It's lessened. That doesn't mean your lifespan expands. No, your lifespan stays at what's predetermined for you took birth in this body. Sometimes, just like in the case of Srila Prabhupada, he said that when he was coming from India to America, he had three heart attacks. And he said that at this time, he was supposed to depart from this material world. But Krishna said, no, I've got this thing I want you to do. So you're not going to depart from this world now. You have to go and do this preaching work. And so Prabhupada took this up enthusiastically, even though he was advanced years, even though he suffered from many physical ailments. Just like I said, three heart attacks, he had diabetes. He had, along with diabetes, he had trouble with his eyes, trouble with various other organs in his body. But he carried on because that was Krishna's direction. And when he was first preaching in the West, people didn't automatically come to him, take initiation. No, it was a long, slow process. And he tolerated this. He had patience. Patience is a symptom of one's determination to go back to Godhead. If you don't have patience, you can't make any kind of spiritual advancement. You're thinking, oh, I've been chanting this Maha Mantra now for seven years. I should be pretty much purified, ready to take on, you know, guru ship and all this kind of stuff. But no, you can be around for 50, 100 years even. And still, you may not be very advanced if you're not surrendered. If you don't follow the principles that are there, beginning with the four regulative principles and the prescribed number of attentive rounds. And as I mentioned before, Rupa Goswami has given all kinds of other guidelines, what to do when and what not to do and when. All those are given if we just pick these books up and read them. You should actually spend during the day, you have 24 hours. And out of those 24 hours, you should spend at least an hour and a half reading these nice books that Prabhupada has translated into English for us. And all kinds of nice explanations in the purports. All this added guidance for us very much contaminated entities of Kali Yuga. So we can't say that help has not been given. There is no guidance. It's just that we go on taking it. So if we are really interested in getting out of this place of misery, because that's what this is, any kind of prison is a place of misery. This means you can't fully experience bliss. In this material world, Happiness or bliss and anxiety are two sides of a coin. 
and we are perceiving something as blissful or anxiety filled according to how much pleasure we can get out of it. And actually all it is is just, it's all misery. And bliss is a little cessation of this misery. Real transcendental bliss can only come when we fully surrender to the Acharya. So one must take an Acharya. That's one of the basic tenets of the Vaishnava faith. Is that one must take someone who has proven by his activities that he wants to go back home, back to God, and then he has learned how to proceed on the path. And you need to take his word as that of God, even though maybe in some future time he may fall down. But still you must maintain some connection with the spiritual path. And don't become deterred by what occurs. Many devotees who have come to his God and gone away from his God, who have taken and retaken anywhere from four to five different times different gurus because some previous guru fell down should not give up the the the, the, the path should not become entangled in material activities now in this chapter or this particular verse is talking about Gandhadakshai, Vishnu, and his expansions. The only thing I can say about them, this is given to help us understand our total inability to comprehend even a plenary portion of the Supreme Lord. One can't come to think that I know God, or I know better than God, or I know better than Krishna. There's no possibility of you knowing anything better than Krishna. <laughs> you can't even really conceive of what he looks like. Although there's a nice description that he has this threefold bending form, the color of a new rain cloud. Hmm? And he appears in so many other forms. So actually, what does he really look like? He's totally unbelievable who he possibly is. We see with our eyes and think that everything we see is the absolute fact. And so we base all our decisions on what we see. And we ignore what we hear from the Vaishnava chariots. And that leads us to more misery. And yet we keep doing these things over and over again, even in our short life span. We do it almost every day. And every day Krishna says, okay, you got another chance today. Good luck. And you say, oh, no, I'm going to get out of it today. I'm going to stop doing that nonsense I did yesterday. Get right back into it. Sometimes even with more fervor than you did the day before. Hmm? We are not very highly elevated. We have to understand that we're born in the most degraded age. And we are also the most degraded people. But that doesn't mean Krishna can't pick us up. He can pick us up at a moment. Hmm? Sometimes the Acharyas turn to Krishna and say, hey, he's helped me a little bit. Get him out of here. And so Krishna does that. So that grace is there. We just have to be receptive to. And if we follow the directions of the Acharyas, with enthusiasm and determination 
and also that patience. If we do this, then Krishna will look our way. Maybe the Acharya will say, hey, Krishna, see what he just did? Come on, slack off a little, let him, let him go. And because the Acharya asks, Krishna is bound to do this. But that doesn't mean in the next in instant you could be going back down because you regret surrendering and you want to enjoy in this material world. So we have to give up this enjoying mentality. We are not trying to do some service to receive pleasure. We're trying to give pleasure to Krishna without concern for our own situation. If you open up the Bhagavatam, there's many stories. Just out of thin air, one is Gandhari. She was a princess from a very wealthy family. Hmm? She was 12 years old at the time of her marriage to a man who was blind. And so to better understand her husband, she voluntarily blindfolded her eyes <clears throat> to experience the difficulties he was having in this material world so that she could act with a good heart towards him. She had a great deal of patience. For many, many years she was blindfolded going through this austerity. She could have taken that blindfold off at any time, but she didn't. Because she needed to know what her husband felt. Now that's surrender. Hmm? That's also patience. That's determination. And you can't do that without some enthusiasm. that's some example. Now, I didn't really speak very much about Garbhadaksha Vishnu because I really don't know very much. And to me, it's not the main point of this purport. The main point of this purport is that there is no way we're going to know Krishna and his expansions or conceive of them in any particular way. That's what that whole purport was about. It's almost three pages long, almost four pages, actually, almost four pages long. And all kinds of points were brought out. But if you actually stop at each sentence and read it through, it's inconceivable. And you think you're so smart. How did you get here in the first place? We really messed up, didn't we? We really messed up to start with. And so if we are coming with some kind of pride, we need to get rid of this pride. Hmm? I know this because I got a name. That's what my name means. There's a whole story in the ninth canto that talks about his pride. Hmm? How, the, how this Rohita became prideful. And so Prabhupada, with a glance, he just looked at me and said, your name is Rohita. Because he could see that pride on me. You know? So we have to be careful with this life. It's a very precious thing. We're given an opportunity to get out of this material world. And we should take this opportunity. So is there any questions, comments, additions, deletions, whatever? Sir.